Hello everyone and welcome to the latest in my Duelist video series produced in partnership with Counterplay Games. Today I want to talk a little bit more about Denizens of Shimzar, the new Duelist expansion that just released. Uh, I was able to talk about uh, a lot of the cards in my first few reviews, but we didn't see everything during the preview period, so I'm going to jump in and talk about the cards uh, that I haven't reviewed just yet. So let's start with Lionar. Uh, the first card I want to talk about is Slow, the Battle Pet. This is a really interesting card to me. For one, it costs zero mana. That's, that's pretty huge. Anything that you can just play for free really requires sort of a level of evaluation that is very different than anything that costs even one mana, simply because you can play it at any time, no matter what you have access to. And specifically the fact that this is a zero cost menu with Provoke is very interesting because you can use it in uh, games to really set up very different kinds of board situations than anything else. Uh, what is most notable about this to me is the way that you can potentially use it in the early games around uh, the Mana Spring tiles and potentially block your opponent off from getting access to them uh, or just even gain access to more of them than you normally could in a single turn on your own. You can actually take control of multiple Mana Spring tiles on the first turn with multiple copies of Slow and play over-costed things from the initial mana you have in your first turn. So this is a very potentially impactful card despite being a zero cost one for. Also the fact that it has provoke means that even if you aren't just using it as a sort of mana accelerant with the mana spring tiles early in the game, means that it can have an impact on the way that your opponent is able to interact with your board on your next turn. So this is a card that I haven't had a chance to play with yet, but I'm definitely pretty excited about trying uh, simply because it has characteristics that uh, are kind of scary in a card. Being zero cost that you're, you know, make it difficult for your opponent to interact with your turn uh, can definitely really, really change the way the games can play out. So a very interesting card, certainly not an impactful one from a just combat perspective. A small provoke minion is just going to attack into uh, opponent's minions anyway because it is a battle pet, uh, but definitely can have a pretty big impact uh, in a lot of stages of the game. All right, the next card I want to talk about is Sun Wisp. Uh, this is a card that is really interesting to me because it is pretty much never bad. Uh, while the replace mechanic in Duelist does make the fact that cards cycle through the, through your deck, uh, you know, a card with that opening game, it draw a card. The fact that it cycles through your deck is less relevant than it could be in, in games with other drawing engines because uh, you can get through your deck more easily. But that being said, sometimes you know you do replace into say, a, a small minion late in the game, and you're like, oh, well, this doesn't really do very much, but if it's a Sun Wisp, well, you go ahead and draw your card, and you can potentially find something larger that can have a bigger impact on the game. It also doesn't cost your resource in some of the earliest stages of the game, when really all you want is a drop to contest Mana Spring Tiles or something of the sort. So this is a, a very, very, not powerful card, uh, but a very effective card for the particular role that it plays, which is just kind of a, a filler spot uh, in your curve to help you contest the Mana Spring tiles early without really costing you resources throughout the game. So I think this is a card that's going to show up in a lot of Lionheart decks, and it's already one that I've put into a lot of my own decks, and I've been very, very happy with. So an excellent card uh, that we'll see a lot of play. All right, Radiant Dragoon. Uh, this is a card that has gotten kind of a lot of hype from a lot of other people in the community, and I'm not really sure I'm buying into it. Uh, the three cost spot in Lionar is already pretty heavily contested. Uh, Silverguard Knight is just super, super good. And it's difficult for me to imagine swapping that out for this Radiant Dragoon. Uh, and if you're playing, say, Xeron build, you have access to Sunforge Lancer. If you're playing an aggressive deck, you might have Saber, uh, Saber Spine Tiger. So there's all kinds of things that you can potentially play in that spot that I think are already quite good. And this is good. This is clearly a solid card, a 3-4. Uh, for three, that the end of your turn gives a friendly minion plus one health. Everything about that is good, but it doesn't jump out at me as being super impactful. It's not like a Silver Guard Knight that can really shape the way that your opponent is sort of forced to play the game because of the Provoke. It's not like, say, the Sunforged Lancer, uh, which can really change the impact of your general in sort of a healing build. So I, I think this is definitely a solid card. I can see it making its way into decks. But it's not really a card that, that I'm excited to build decks around because its impact doesn't feel huge to me. All right, so let's talk about an interesting card, Sky Burial. This is uh, an extension of the Decimate effect, which kills all the minions that aren't near generals, but this only kills one minion and it doesn't affect your own, so pretty big difference there, but following with the mechanic really in Lionar. Uh, 
it's difficult for me to really see this seeing a lot of play, simply because it competes with Martyrdom, which is a more universal removal spell. And if you're playing an aggressive deck, where you don't want to give your opponent the health gain from Martyrdom, you're probably interested in killing things like Provoke Minions that are next to their general, so Sky Burial is less likely to be applicable there. Uh, but I can maybe see it fitting into decks as kind of a one of or, or, or maybe a two of for a uh, another sort of removal effect that can be really effective in particular situations. But uh, I don't have super high hopes for that one. All right, lastly, for uh, previously unrevealed line art card, we have Dawn's Eye. This is a six cost legendary artifact, so it's already kind of got to do a lot. And it is your general gets plus four attack at the end of your turn, repair all of your artifacts to full durability. Now, this is a card that feels like it's really going to be potentially powerful with, say, Arclight Regalia, because if you're able to, you know, set up a uh, huge amount of buffs on your general and make it difficult for them to damage you and repair your artifacts every turn, obviously that's a really powerful effect. But you're, we're already talking about Arclight Regalia, which is already relatively expensive, costs four, gives you plus two, and then another six cost artifact to give you plus four. It feels like it's kind of a lot of, of investment. By itself, Dawn's Eye is actually pretty interesting, too, because you know you get plus four attack, which is pretty big. It's an efficient way to get plus four attack. If we're comparing it to a raw attack boost like Adamantite Claws, you're overpaying significantly for the effect. Uh, but the fact that you know, you're know you pretty much on your own turn not paying for the, uh, the durability loss of your general attacking because you immediately restore back up, that's pretty strong. Uh, but I just I just can't buy it. It doesn't seem like it really does enough to justify the expense, especially considering the sort of way it feels like Lionheart decks want to play. So uh, I would be surprised to see Don's Eye show up in a lot of competitive decks, which is unfortunate because I opened a ton of them. All right, moving along to Songhai, uh, we will start with Ace, the one-two ranged battle pet. Uh, now that we've really confirmed the behavior of battle pets, uh, it's difficult for me to really. Uh, see this fitting into a deck because even ranged battle pets will just march onto their doom so you've got to be super careful with placing them maybe they'll get some amount of incremental damage in hard for me to really imagine this guy being great that said it's a one cost ranged minion which means obviously you can play with heart seeker and maybe you want a, a a particular density of ranged minions to make a, a deck that has a bunch of things that buff ranged minions for instance or uh, you know just lots of buffs for your ranged minions things like uh, the Death Strike Seal or whatever else that can make them, doesn't matter what the closest thing is, it's dead. So I can imagine if a deck wants a certain density of that specific kind of thing being efficient range minions, maybe you reach for this battle pet as well, but otherwise it's difficult for me to imagine this really seeing a lot of play. All right, let's move on to Crimson Coil. This is another battle pet card. This is one though that seems fairly powerful because uh, it, for two it deals two to a minion, which is Okay, you know, this it's a, a decent removal-ish effect already. Um, obviously not super great, but activating all of your battle pets is just a very powerful effect if you are playing a battle pet-focused deck. There's a, a lot of various battle pet cards that we've seen uh, throughout all of the factions. This is the one that seems among the most powerful to me, simply because just reactivating all of your battle pets in a single turn can generate a huge burst of damage. That's kind of what... Songhai decks often want to do anyway. So if there is a Songhai battle pet deck, I think this is going to be the cornerstone of it. As whether that's likely to happen, probably not, but this is definitely a card that I think is worth keeping an eye on because this effect of activating essentially all of your minions if you're playing a hugely battle pet focused deck does seem very powerful. All right, moving along to the card that has my favorite name in the set, Pandemonium. Um, this is a card that transforms all minions into 0-2 Pandos uh, that can't be attacked until the end of the turn. Uh, obviously, uh, calling back to Onyx Bear Seal, sort of the AoE version of it. And this is a card that by itself, I think, is clearly not very powerful. It you know doesn't really let you do very much in terms of generating you know board presence beyond this. Like for instance, you can't use this and then attack their minion with your general. That's not like a way you can use it as a removal spell. Uh, so it's it's only sort of buying you a window where the the minions you know can't either can't actually block you. Say you can get through provoke minions with this if you're attacking with your general, um, or you can use it in combination with damage effects to kill opposing things. Uh, for instance, if you play Pandemonium, then play Crescent Spear, and then play Ghost Lightning, you know, you're going to be dealing two damage to all opposing minions, and well, they're all 0-2, so they all die. Um, that's you know a way I could see this card being used as to whether you know that sort of combination of things 
is uh, is likely to be good enough to include in a deck with how how powerful a lot of the sort of spell high options already are. My guess is probably not, but it's the sort of thing that's worth keeping an eye on because this kind of effect uh, can be very very powerful in a game where it's often difficult for especially song high to really have like AOE style removal uh, and something that can set up removal of even the the biggest board uh, is is worth keeping an eye on. All right, then we have Onyx Jaguar. It's a five cost three three. Whenever a friendly minion is moved for any reason, give it plus one plus one. Hard for me to imagine this really fitting into a deck. It seems like it's obviously a strong card that works with your other cards that can you know, teleport things. But by itself, it's a, a pretty big mana investment for a relatively small body. Obviously, works particularly well with the Blink ability, uh, the Bloodborne spell, uh, as as well as you know Mist Dragon Seal things like that. Uh, and it is it is pretty powerful because its effect happens right away. If you do have multiple minions in play, and you play this, you can then move your minions and they, they all get plus attack in addition to whatever sort of ad additional effects you may be using to move them around. But often, if you have multiple minions in play as Song High when you start your turn anyway, and you're getting to move them around and attack with them, you're usually in a pretty good spot in, uh, in a constructed game. It's not like your Chakri avatars or your Gore Horns and such tend to need a lot of help in order to uh, to be par powerful on the board in, in a game. Uh, maybe this goes into some sort of deck that I was mentioning before with a bunch of small ranged minions, because you, know, you can play this and then move your Heart Seekers around and suddenly they'll double in power, and that's maybe pretty powerful, but uh, it seems like a tough card to really make great use of in terms of its efficiency. All right, so one of the favorite cards uh, Functionally, in the set, has to be Grandmaster Zendo, which is your enemy general moves and attacks as though they're a battle pet, and it's attached to a 4-6 body for 6. And this is just a hilarious effect to me, because, you know, your opponent just kind of wanders around hitting whatever's close to them, you know, you've, you've put them into a, you know, drunken stupor, or whatever it is. I don't know the flavor of it, but the actual gameplay seems hilarious, because, you've, you know, your opponent... Normally, he's trying to maneuver really well, and, and you, oh, sorry, you just jumped into my guy and died. Um, so by itself, this is almost, at a minimum, going to let you, you know, put this in front of your opponent, and they have to attack into it, or whatever you, you know, your biggest thing nearby is, and that's often just going to do a lot of damage that can maybe just finish your opponent off, uh, and forcing your opponent to walk toward you when they might be trying to escape, all these things are actually, I think, quite strong, so... My initial impression was, haha, this is funny, but then the more I thought about it, I think maybe this is actually a pretty good card. That, that said, Song High decks mostly tend to be focused on sort of these burst kill kind of potential rather than developing a board, and developing a strong board of minions is where a, a card like this is going to be at its best, because obviously if you have a, a good board, you can force your opponent to attack into it, they're taking significant damage, but if you're a more spell-focused deck, this may be the biggest minion you have, and that's not nearly as scary, but... Uh, definitely a super cool card, and I do think one that has significant potential to be really competitively viable. All right, moving on to Vitruvian. Uh, Vitruvian has a couple of battle pets. There's Ray, which is a zero cost, again, really worth paying attention to anything that costs zero. Uh, it's a 1-1 one, one that, with a dying wish of Dispel the nearest enemy minion. Uh, kind of interesting, the Dispel effect uh, can give even this sort of zero cost thing potentially some value. Uh, but it requires it to actually die in a time. It's usually going to be on your opponent's turn, so they can move their guys, their best guys away from it and force it to attack into something that's not necessarily good. Um, but again, the fact that it, it does cost zero can give you some weird mana spring game sort of things at the beginning of the, uh, of the game. I don't feel like it's likely to be as good as the zero cost Lionar because I think the one for Provoke is a more impactful body when you do draw it later in the game which is harder for your opponent to maneuver around quite as well. Uh, but again, anything that costs zero, worth paying attention to, especially because the early game mana spring uh, tricks that are possible. The battle bit that I do think seems pretty good, though, is Pax. Uh, the 2-1 two for two with Dying Wish, summon two 2-2 two, two Dervishes. A lot of twos there. <laughs> um, if only he started as a 2-2 two, two as well. It'd be a 2-2 two, two for two that summoned two 2-2s. Two, anyway, um, if you're playing a deck that has things that... that Pump Dervishes, I mean, this is obviously in, it, in itself pretty powerful, but even just outside of that, even outside of having Dervish, you know, buffing things, obelisks, whatever, you're essentially paying two for three 2-2 two -two bodies, three two-power-ish bodies. Uh, you don't have control of the first one, but you do get control over the uh, the Iron Dervishes, so this is just kind of a, a pretty good deal uh, just up front in terms of what you're getting for what you're paying. 
So I, I think this is a card that does have potentially some uh, some real merit to it, and I uh, could imagine this seeing play in, uh, in decks that uh, can take advantage of those Dervish bodies. All right, the next card is Astral Flood. Uh, this is the Vitruvian Battle Pet card, which puts three random Battle Pets into your action bar. Uh, kind of interesting. I don't think this feels super powerful, just because the power level of the actual battle pets in general is relatively low. Obviously there are things like packs, which we just talked about, that can be quality cards uh, in the right circumstances, the right deck, but you're not really looking to just get a bunch of them in your hand in most cases. I mean, there is the, the calculator, the, the sort of minion that gets buffed for each of your battle pets, but that's super, super vulnerable to, to dispel effects. and. I don't think a really super viable card in in most builds, but maybe maybe I'll be uh, I'll be proven wrong on that one. Uh, but this one just it feels like you're not getting enough for what you're paying. You know, three is a lot to pay for something that doesn't impact the board in any way, uh, and a lot of the battle pets you could be getting. It's like you get you know two rays and a pax in your hand, and you are, you know you you didn't develop your board at all, and you paid three minutes. Like that's not really very valuable. So. Uh, my inclination is that it's unlikely that Astral Flood will see a lot of constructive play. Next card is Psychic Conduit. This is a pretty interesting card. Uh, sort of a Ray of Command effect from, uh, from Magic the Gathering, if you're familiar. Uh, kind of like a, a Zenrui effect, but it is a temporary effect. But the fact that it's temporary, and this is actually this is not a card that I've had a chance to play yet, but my, I have to assume that you, you can actually attack with the minion during your turn. So you can potentially take a, a opposing two attack minion and attack it into your opponent's guy that's nearby, which generally will let you kill it. So that's pretty powerful. You know, if you're, you're effectively killing two of your opponent's guys for one card, obviously they have to be sort of similarly sized and you're not necessarily going to be able to actually kill two guys unless they're both two twos or whatever attacking into each other. Um, but it can have a pretty significant board swing because it has an immediate effect right now uh, and, you know, it's kind of like a removal spell that also deals damage to your opponent's other creature if you're able to attack into another one of their guys. So, uh, definitely a, a card worth keeping note of, but probably not likely to see tons of play, uh, simply because Zenry is, uh, is a more powerful version of this effect in, in, in most instances, unless you really care uh, about the sort of immediate tempo or the, uh, just the, the slightly lower cost. All right, the next card up is Allomancer. Uh, this is a 4-3 for 4 with Dying Wish, so I'm going to random Obelisk on this space. And this is an interesting card because, uh, you know, the, if you're playing an Obelisk deck, a uh, structure-based deck, this is a way to not only get additional structures effect effectively, um, but to do so potentially at value, because if Allomancer is able to trade into something and then give you that Obelisk, you're effectively getting the, the trade plus the Obelisk uh, for the cost of the single card and for the, the actual development cost of just the Allomancer. Obviously, it's a little bit downstatted. It's a 4-3, so it's going to die two things down the curve, uh, but it's giving you pretty significant value if you're able to actually get a decent trade-off with it. So uh, it's possible that Obelisk-based decks uh, may be interested in playing this as a way to you know get that value, get a little bit of tempo while developing a board of additional Obelisks, especially if you're playing cards like Whisper of the Sands or Circle of Desiccation. The more ways that you are able to... Uh, build up your your board of obelisks, and the more you're able to pump your dervishes and such, the more value you're getting from all of them. So uh, probably not going to be a particularly big constructed contender, but I can see it maybe finding a home in those decks. All right, the next card up is Nimbus. Now this is a pretty interesting card that obviously can fit into those obelisk desks. No, decks we're talking about. Uh, whenever it takes damage, it's a five cost, three, eight. It summons a soul burn obelisk nearby, and the soul burn obelisk uh, is a zero four obelisk, clearly important, uh, that kills any minion that damages it. Now, this is pretty interesting because you know, by itself, the, that, that minion doesn't really do anything, but it can gum up the board, you know, prevent your opponent from uh, from being able to move effectively around, uh, and also obviously works with, with things like Whisper of the Sands, giving you additional ways to actually make wind dervishes with the Whisper, uh, but also is kind of a, a counterplay to any sort of AoE type uh, cards your opponent might have. For instance, your opponent has a Spirit Harvester, or a White Widow, or a Blistering Scorn. All of these would just die if there's a single Soulburn Obelisk on the board. So it's kind of, I think, a, a sort of sleeper type card from the set uh, that can really gum up the works for a lot of opponents uh, by creating these Obelisks. And it's, it is pretty difficult to kill. It's a, you know, a, a huge health 4 or 5 cost minion uh, that combos very well with some of those Obelisk support cards like Whisper uh, that are in the set. So uh, it's a card that I, I think could 
end up seeing play isn't, isn't a card that immediately jumps out at me as, oh, wow, this is amazing, but it is a legendary card, so uh, it, it is certainly a card that I think people will be experimenting with and I think may very well have success with. All right, the next card is Corpse Combustion. This is a, kind of a weird card. It goes with the Dying Wish theme, which is sort of a theme of Vitruvian. Uh, there are, you know, obviously very powerful Dying Wish minions uh, like a Mara Healer that are uh, sort of highlight Vitruvian, but there's not a ton of others. There, you know, the Allomancer we just talked about, Ray, Pax, uh, but the, uh, what's the, 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 whatever the 4 3 flyer, the Dying Wish draw card, that's another one. I totally forget his name right now. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, there are some sort of undead Vitruvian themes going on with the Dying Wish here, and obviously Corpse Combustion is powerful with all of these cards. Uh, it is important to note that it will only affect cards uh, that your opponent killed during their turn, and I believe also cards that, that you were able to trade during your own turn. So if you're able to build up a board of a significant number of Dying Wish minions and trade them off and then cast Corpse Combustion, it can be very explosive. But if your opponent recognizes the, the threat of corpse combustion and picks your Dying Wish minions off, so no more than, say, one or two of them, or at least no more than one or two high-impact ones, die during a single turn, it's much more difficult to get value out of this. But even if you just get a single Amara healer from this, this can be a powerful card. So kind of acting as Amara healers uh, 4, 5, and 6, or maybe just 4 and 5, I don't know if you want 3 of these in your deck, that can be pretty powerful in a lot of situations. So uh, this is a card that I think is potentially going to be difficult to use for a lot of uh, a lot of decks, but could really have uh, very, very explosive high-impact turns that it generates. So uh, definitely a card that I have my eye on and I plan to experiment with. All right, the next card is Spine Cleaver. This is actually a card that I opened a whole bunch of. Uh, it's a kind of a weird card. Uh, it's a five cost legendary artifact that gives you a general plus one attack and whenever it kills an enemy minion, the opposing general summons a blood fire totem in that space. So it's a little bizarre because it's actually creating things for your opponent, but the blood fire totems are structures that deal damage to your opponent at the end of each turn. So if you actually you know use spine cleaver, kill a couple of things, uh, you are just sort of creating these structures that pile up and continue to deal damage to your opponent unless they can somehow kill them. And because they are zero attack structures, they are gonna have some trouble killing them without sort of dispels or sacrifice effects. Uh, so if you are able to kill multiple things with your general during that period while you have Spine Cleaver equipped, it can give you a very strong long game plan uh, of grinding your opponent out with this incremental damage. But you're paying five for plus one attack which is pretty bad deal in the grand scheme of things. So uh, while it, it definitely seems cool to create a bunch of, uh, of prickly totems that are killing your opponent, I, I'm hard pressed to see Spine Cleaver really seeing a lot of constructive competitive play. All right, moving on to Abyssian. Uh, one of the most interesting cards in Abyssian uh, that we just saw with the release is Gore, a battle pet. It costs two, uh, it is a one one. Uh, and with Dying Wish, summon a copy of this minion in a random unoccupied corner kind of like a two-cost Sarlacc for purposes of being able to sacrifice it uh, and potentially trigger those those death uh, death triggers. But it is not nearly as effective as Sarlacc because you have to proactively sacrifice it. Uh, can't really just move it around and attack it into opponent things, things like that. So I think that if you're playing a deck that wants more sort of Sarlacc effects, uh, you may want some number of gore. Uh, but I think that if you're looking for just the repeatable sacrifice ability uh, of the uh, the Sarlacc style effect, it's probably going to be better than Gore simply because it's controllable. You're not going to be able to activate the death effects quite as consistently as you want to because Gore is a battle pet and has a mind of its own. So uh, more fuel for that if you're looking for it, but probably won't replace Sarlacc in those decks, even though it is cheaper. Uh, the next card is another battle pet, Ooze. Uh, this is a, a card that when I first saw it, was I was kind of confused. It's a 3-3 for 2, which is relatively strong to begin with. Whenever it takes damage, turn a space occupied by an enemy into a Shadow Creep. I thought that it, uh, whenever it takes damage from something, it turned that space into a, a Shadow Creep, but it's actually just a random space that an opposing minion is on. So this is actually pretty powerful in terms of just being able to generate significant amounts of Shadow Creep. Uh, if this takes two hits to kill, it's gonna generate two Shadow Creeps for you and uh, immediately getting value from them because they do appear under your opponent's guys that are already in play. Uh, so it can be a, a pretty strong effect overall. 
uh, attached to a pretty efficient body. So this is a battle pet that I think does have potential. I've actually seen people put it in their decks and play it against me already, and it seemed like it was actually a pretty reasonable body uh, and effect for what you were paying. So uh, this is a card that I think it's worth keeping an eye on as the Shadow Creep decks evolve with the new mechanics from Shimzar. All right, the next uh, card I want to talk about is Echoing Shriek. Uh, this is a bizarre card. It transforms all minions that cost two or less into 1-1 one, one Wraithlings. So uh, this is a card that's obviously very effective against opponents who are playing more efficient, more powerful two-cost minions to turn all their things into Wraithlings. Uh, and it obviously works at its best when you are just trying to buff Wraithlings or just have a bunch of Wraithlings, so it doesn't really impact the strength of your board at all. Uh, I don't know that this is really necessarily a card that I uh, I totally see having a lot of uh, a lot of viability competitively simply because it's not doesn't do anything against opposing minions that cost more than two. Uh, it's very difficult to use proactively, I think, uh, simply because there aren't like wraithling lores that buff all your wraithlings or anything like that. Uh, so. I, I do think this is an interesting card, and I'm excited to see the potential maybe people explore with it, uh, but it, it is hard-pressed for me, or rather, I am hard-pressed to see it see much competitive play. Although I was just talking about how there aren't really Wraithling Lords, but Blood Baronet is kind of a Wraithling buffer. 3-3-3 um, three, three three that uh, doubles a nearby Wraithling's attack and health. Uh, this is obviously powerful with you know the, the Wraithling buff cards. You can make gigantic Wraithlings individually, uh, but I don't really know that this is this is necessarily a style of play that is likely to be especially successful, uh, largely because there's so many ways that people can build sort of decks that are so good against the Wraithlings, things like Blistering Scorn, Spirit Harvester, and you don't get to play those Soulburn Obelisks that the Vitruvian uh, can get access to. Uh, but it, you know, it, it's interesting to see more sort of angles for Abyssian, and if the Wraithling one is one that can take off, I, you know, it'll be cool to see. All right, the next card could be a card that goes into those Wraithling decks, Void Steel, uh, which gives a enemy minion minus three attack, and nearby friendly minions get plus three attack. Uh, so this is obviously a card that works especially well in those Wraithling decks, uh, though this obviously works very well in sort of a Wraithling Swarm style deck. Mostly what this cares about is having a lot of minions in play near the opposing minions. So you don't really care about buffing an individual Wraithling like the Blood Baronet does. This just wants you to have a lot of them, and that's much more the Wraithling style of play. Uh, but this can be a very, very strong card uh, if you are kind of able to swarm around, especially your opponent's general, uh, with a bunch of Wraithlings, and then, boop, Void Steal your nearest guy, buff all my Wraithlings, charge in for the kill. Uh, it, the fact that it is kind of a removal effect that also can be a, a combat buff effect for your Wraithlings makes me think that this is a card that does have potential uh, and may end up seeing some constructed play. Uh, next card is the Abyssian Legendary, one of the Abyssian Legendaries, Abyssian Legendary Minion, uh, which is Klaxon. It's a 6 cost, 6-6 six, six Provoke, with Dying Witch turn 6 random spaces into Shadow Creep. So, to start, it's just a big Provoke Minion, uh, which is not really something that Abyssian has, has access to otherwise, uh, with a, you know that obviously fits very well into a defensively oriented Shadow Creep deck that's looking to play a very long game. So. A, you have a, a, a big provoke that can keep you alive. B, oh, they killed it. All right, well, now you have tons of Shadow Creep to follow up with something like, say, Obliterate. So this is a card that I think does certainly have potential in those long game uh, Shadow Creep focused decks. And uh, I'm, I'm certainly excited to see uh, if it can be sort of a defensive cornerstone for that style of play. All right, next up we have Magmar. And uh, Magmar is actually one of the factions that and uh, Lion are probably to no one's surprise that I've played the most already. Uh, in the uh, the expansion, and let's just start off, and I can talk about some of these cards in, in reality, rather than just in theory, so Rex. In my experience, this guy is not good. The small battle pets can have a really hard time against, well, almost anything, because they, you know, the Rebirth in particular makes the battle pet uh, kind of AI awkward sometimes, because it'll walk up, get itself killed, be an egg, and now you can't move on to that spot where your Rex died, and that can cause a lot of problems. I actually had a bunch of Rexes that came off of a Nature's Confluence, and they just kept running forward, dying, and then the other ones would get stuck behind their eggs and wouldn't actually be able to attack. So it's interesting how it can kind of be a drawback with the uh, the Rebirth there, uh, but maybe there is a sort of Rebirth deck uh, with, you know, Dreadnoughts, Wild Inceptors that Rex does fit in, uh, but I didn't even like him in my Battle Pet-focused Magmar deck and ended up ultimately cutting him from that. So. Not really a card that I expect to see a lot of competitive play, but I might be missing the niche so far. 
All right, next up we have the battle pet that I do think might be pretty good in Grow. Uh, this is a two cost, two four Grow, plus one plus one, uh, aptly named, I think. Uh, but this is kind of an interesting card because it is a battle pet that uh, gets progressively more powerful, so you, you don't necessarily want to play it in quite the same way that you might play others. You uh, will often maybe just want to stick it back into the corner and be like, okay, you, be safe over here as it gets bigger and just marches toward your opponent's minions. Uh, just the, the, the raw stats you're getting on this, the raw efficiency, uh, if it survives a single turn, gets to move forward, you're getting a 3-5 for 2, and if it survives longer than that, the value just goes up from there. Um, so this is, even with just the, the Battle Pet AI as a drawback, such a good deal in a lot of instances uh, that I think that you can get a lot of value out of it in, in a lot of games. So I haven't been quite able to wrap my head around just how big of a drawback the AI is. Uh, it's definitely very real, but just the raw efficiency you're getting from the stats of Grow with the Grow ability uh, can really, really give you a huge threat very early in the game. So uh, this is a card that I definitely have my eye on and uh, I'm definitely planning on experimenting with in my aggressive Magmar decks myself. Next we have uh, Thumping Wave. This is a very weird card to me. It gives a minion plus five attack, and at the end of the turn, transform it into a 3-3 three, three kin. What? Like, I, it is so hard for me to wrap my head around what's trying to happen here, like the story of what's happening, or what you're really like using this card for. I mean, maybe this is a card that you use on kind of a, a mid-sized minion Kraken for a lot of damage, get it damaged, and then just, you know, your guy transforms. Um, maybe it's a finisher card, you're getting quite a bit of damage for the cost. You use this on, say, a rush minion or something like that. But it's very, very difficult for me to figure out what is going on here exactly and exactly how you might use it. So I don't see a deck where this really goes into. Maybe it's just a burst damage thing. Maybe it's a burst damage thing slash like removal spell for a, a big opposing guy, but you can't use it to get past provoke minions because it doesn't turn it into the 3-3 until the end of the turn. So I feel like, you know, the rabbit like thumping on my head in the graphic or something as I'm trying to wrap my head around how you might use this card. So someone tell me, what do you, why would you use Thumping Wave? I don't understand. Let me know in the comments. Anyway, moving on. All right, the next card is a really interesting one, which is Morin Kerr. It is the legendary artifact from Magmar, uh, which gives your general plus three attack Whenever your general deals damage, hatch all friendly eggs. A little bit inefficient compared to the gold standard of just straight attack boosts in Adamantite Claws, which Magmar has access to, uh, but gives you the, the benefit of, well, every time you hit something, all your eggs go which is actually very powerful with the new Rebirth rules because all of those hatched eggs effectively have rush. So, you know, say you have a, a veteran Silthar, you attack it into something, it dies, you war incur, attack something, your veteran Silthar comes back, gets to attack again. That's pretty powerful. And I think may be worth the inefficiency that you're getting in terms of the straight uh, attack stats on the war incur. So I'm, I'm not 100% on this, but it is a card that feels like it could be very strong in that sort of rebirth deck that it feels like is really being pushed with stuff like Dreadnought, Wild and Scepter. Uh, and, you know, the new Rebirth rules, even just Rebirth uh, on a young Silithar with this can be very, very powerful, I think. So uh, I'm definitely looking forward to experimenting with this and the new Rebirth minions, and uh, I'm excited to see how it works. All right, and then we have the huge spell for Magmar, the 8-cost Flying Stampede. Deal 5 damage to all non-egg minions and generals. This is sort of a weird card because... Uh, it does kill all your own minions that are not currently, you know, uh, incubating. Uh, but if they are, uh, <laughs> if they are non-eggs, uh, they well, they probably have rebirth if you're playing an egg deck. Uh, this is, you know, a pretty huge AOE. Uh, though Magmar is a faction that's not really lacking in its ability to do a lot to affect the board. You have uh, Plasma Storm already. You have War Beast, which can affect area effect on a board. You have Spirit Harvester. Lots of various ways. Uh, that you can you know, sort of clear the board, clean up the board. Uh, I don't know that you really want an eight cost card when a lot of what you're doing with your your sort of big cards in most of the Magmar decks is just playing big minions like Sylith or Elder. I don't think you can really fit all of that in the deck, but I can certainly imagine a world in which you're looking for this as specifically an answer to uh, 
a style of deck out there that maybe your other AOE doesn't line up for, uh, doesn't line up with well. But my, my inclination is this won't be a staple in any kind of Magmar decks, but maybe sort of a metagame one of in uh, Magmar Control uh, that's looking for a specific kind of board wipe. And the last Magmar card uh, is Mandrake, which is a, a 12 cost 6-6, six, six, pretty bad, but it costs one less for each minion summoned from any player's action bar this game. This is a weird card because you have sort of some control over it uh, in that, you know, it's better in a deck that has a lot of minions rather than one that has a lot of spells. Uh, and in particular, is better in a deck that has a lot of uh, smaller minions. You know, maybe this is a card that goes into, say, a Starhorn deck, because you can just sort of churn out a lot of small minions, and then you know your opponent is also drawing extra cards from Starhorn's ability. Uh, and you know, eventually, it's like, oh well, I play three Mandrakes in a turn, and you're, you know, you go, and whoa, suddenly I you know had this huge swingy individual board uh, explosion in, in one turn. I'm not buying it yet, but it is a card that, that I think, you know, that's where I see it being played, is that style of aggro Starhorn type of deck. Uh, it doesn't feel like it's probably enough, even in that style of deck, to, to really build to. It's like, even if we both played 12, 12 minions in a game, and ta-da, you know, or we've each played 6 minions in a game, is this really the kind of board swing that is going to get me back into a game when... Uh, I may be sort of significantly behind in resources because I'm just giving my opponent extra cards. And they get a Bloodborne spell that doesn't give me any bonus. So, I don't know, but uh, it's it's definitely an interesting, interesting enough card for me to want to explore it. Um, so, and I, I just kind of feel bad for Starhorn. I always want to try and build Starhorn decks, so maybe I'll try this one. Now we're getting into Vanar with... Uh, Vespiric Call. I, I've talked in, in previous uh, review videos about how the Vespir mechanic feels a little bit disjointed uh, in Vanar, but this is a card that is definitely an interesting one because it effectively gives you more Vespir minions in your deck. And that's kind of a big deal in a deck that, that cares about the concentration of Vesper minions. Uh, you know, like, like Glacial Elemental wants you to have a certain number of Vesper minions, and well, there's not that many. Well, here's, here's a way to sort of increase the density of Vesper minions in your deck. The fact that you have Replace as a basic game rule in Duelist makes a card like this that has potentials for a, a not great outcome a lot less detrimental than they might otherwise be in some other games. You know, it's like, oh, I, I, I Vesper Call and I get a Snow Chaser. It's like, okay, you know, this is kind of lame. But you've only spent one mana on the Vesper Call, and at worst, you, you can replace the Snow Chaser into your deck. Uh, to try and find something better. And that's you know, a pretty big deal in terms of the possible upside of this. Because you say you play this and you get you know, a Glacial Elemental on turn one. It's like, okay, well, you can play this very easily alongside additional things in, in, and make it more difficult for your opponent to remove because it has plus one, plus one, and cost one less. So you, you know, it, it creates additional sort of lines of play available to you. That's a big part of this, by the way. The fact that this reduces the cost of the, uh, the minion that you get. Uh, it does mean that it pairs up especially well with the Glacial Elemental, which is one of the most powerful sort of uh, reasons to play a lot of Vesper minions, at least right now. So I think this is an interesting card. I'm definitely looking forward to building Vesper decks and experimenting with the new synergies that do exist, especially this one. All right, next we have Icy, uh, which is a 2-3 battle pet with the opening gamut. Stun a nearby enemy minion or general. Uh, this is a kind of weird card. The, the stun is... Pretty valuable, but the fact that it is on a battle pet uh, means that, you know, it's like, okay, I stun you, but then I just go and kill myself on your guy. And, and I've talked a lot about how the, the cheap battle pets, the two-cost battle pets, can't really count as two drops in the same way as uh, a lot of others can, simply because of their inability to effectively contest mana tiles. Um, so I, my, my inclination that this is not really likely to be a particularly uh, powerful card, uh, but it it may be sort of a, a stronger sort of mid-game tempo type card in terms of shutting down some of your opponent's larger minions, which is something that Vanar can be actually be quite good at. You know, a, a, a say Kara deck might be interested in Icy because it is just a body that can attach to the uh, the kinetic surge and just get bigger and bigger and give you you know a quick okay well I'll stun your guy uh, in the sort of mid-game which gives me this tempo swing that allows me to maybe overcome a game that I was I was losing in against the larger minions. So. Uh, that said, Vanar has tons of ways to deal with big minions already. Maybe this isn't the way you're going to go. Next up is Burr, uh, a 3-3 battle pet for two, uh, with a weird ability. When it survives damage, it turns into a different battle pet. Most of the battle pets, as we've seen, are, are relatively small, uh, but some of them are fairly large. And it, you know, this has the opportunity 
to turn into some pretty powerful cards. Uh, and the sort of baseline for it isn't that bad. There aren't that many, uh, from my understanding at least, uh, the, all the things that, that turn into random things only pull from your faction and the neutral ones. It's entirely possible that I'm wrong with Burr uh, because I haven't actually seen this card in action yet, but uh, most of the ones that do say random seem to be random within what is legal for your deck to contain. And uh, you know, both Burr and Icy are at least reasonably sized. You're not gonna get it like a 1-1 one -one from some of the other factions. Uh, and there are some you know, big battle pets that could be a really strong result from this. Um, so you know, again, maybe this is the sort of thing that you know, you're, you're playing a, uh, a, a sort of tempo-based deck, maybe a Kara deck, that this could uh, be, this wouldn't really be, be particularly good in a Kara deck because you can't really buff it itself, but uh, a tempo-oriented deck that can get you know, just some value out of the body early on, uh, and then you know, have the, the opportunity to, to sort of trade it up in the future. But uh, it's probably not a card that we'll see a lot of play, both because you know, battle pets, weird AI issues, and the randomness in a lot of competitive players aren't super keen on cards that, uh, that require uh, getting fortunate to get good outcomes out of them. All right, next up we have Altered Beast. This is a kind of a weird card. Uh, it's a two-cost spell, transform any minion into a random battle pet. It kind of feels like Vanar's thing is transforming guys. You know, we have Aspect of the Fox, which turns a you know guy into a 3-3 three, three fox for one. So I don't really know why the Altered Beast uh, it would be something you'd be interested in playing over Aspect of the Fox, simply because A, it costs twice as much mana, uh, and B, it has a, a much wider range of effects. If you play Aspect of the Fox, you know you're getting it. You know that, okay, your big minion is now a 3-3, or you know your damaged minion is now a 3-3. You're you know, sort of building it up a little bit or taking them down. Uh, this is a much wider range of possibilities. You know, you could end up giving them something great, um, or you know, playing your own guy and getting something really bad. So it seems pretty mediocre to me. It doesn't really seem like a card that'll really find a home, uh, simply because of the competition that does exist. All right, uh, next up we have Ice Blade Dryad. This is uh, basically the Song Chaser uh, that is back, but it's a Vesper card now, which is great because it was pretty silly when it was in any faction because this combination of effects is actually super powerful, as we saw uh, as that card got played all over the place. Uh, but this is another card that goes into, obviously, the sort of Vesper deck, uh, and it really feels like the expansion is uh, giving that deck a lot more tools and just... Obviously, anything that is is based on uh, sort of tribal style synergies is going to get more powerful as there's more of that to play. Uh, and this is not only a Vesper minion that can combine with anything else that cares about Vesper minions, uh, but also something that is a very powerful synergy card for those Vesper minions. So, if there's a Vesper deck, this is going to be in it. And uh, I think there might be enough tools for there to be a successful Vesper deck uh, now that Shimzar is out. All right, next up we have Wailing Overdrive. Uh, this gives a friendly minion the opposing side of the battlefield plus five, plus five. Uh, so we really, really want to infiltrate them uh, because once we do, this is getting super, super big. Uh, I think that when you're playing as Vanar, you already want to stay on your your uh, opponent's side of the, uh, of the board. And this just really, really exacerbates that because this is a very powerful buff spell. Like most buff spells in Duelist aren't really super, super strong in terms of the, the stats that you get for your cost. But this is giving you a lot of stats for its price. You know, plus five, plus five for four is bigger than, you know, just a, a four cost minion. So you're effectively getting uh, a, a rush five, five that you get to attach to another minion that's already in play. So uh, I can see this actually being a, a card that, that has enough power to end up, you know, finding a home in competitive decks. Uh, as long as you know your opponents don't get on, get wise to you, or you can keep them pushed over there as to how effective it'll be, I don't know. But it's a lot of raw stats for uh, the cost, so I, I do think it has the potential to find a home. All right, next up we have Frostburn, which is a five-cost spell, deal three damage to all enemy minions. Uh, this is a pretty interesting card because it actually gives Vanar a a board sweeper type card. It's not really necessarily a sweeper; it's three damage, which isn't enough to kill a lot of large minions, but it is enough damage. Uh, to clear off uh, a significant number of, uh, of things and to actually give a Vanar control deck a tool to, well, play a controlling game. It's always been kind of a struggle for Vanar is that uh, they had these these cards like Crystal Wisp to try and play a longer game control style of deck, uh, but they never really have the tools in terms of the card pool to actually support the rest of them. Uh, now I think that the issue is actually more that they don't have Bloodborne spells that really support that style of deck because 
Uh, obviously, Faye's Bloodborne spell supports an aggressive style of deck, and uh, Kara's Bloodborne spell really wants to play a deck that's built around having a lot of minions that you're, you're, you're buffing with the Kinetic Surge. So now that they actually have a tool to play a controlling game, there isn't really the, the rest of you know the, the sort of uh, archetype stuff that lines up with it. So I think this is a card that is kind of without a place right now, given the generals that Venner that do exist, uh, but is a, is a powerful card that might find a home in the future. All right, last up we have the neutral cards. I'm gonna go through a lot of these pretty quickly because a lot of them don't really have that much going on. All right, Koi, 3-1 Battle Pet, takes no damage from generals. Not that good, it's a battle pet, just gonna run into something and die. Next, Emu, 3-3 three, three for two, battle pet. We have a lot of 3-3s three, for two with abilities that are battle pets, probably won't see play. If there's a battle pet deck, maybe because it's just, you know, reasonably raw stats for, for the cost, but probably not. All right, next up, Soul. Uh, this is a battle pet that I actually think may have pretty significant potential. Uh, it obviously goes into a battle pet deck because its ability is activated friendly battle pet. So uh, if you're looking to get multiple attacks off of a powerful battle pet, we'll get to one of them very soon. This can be very strong, uh, but generally just giving you a more value for your overset of guys who are already in play, give you a bit more control over them because you can decide when you play this. Powerful card. Next we have Hydrax. 3-3 uh, three, three, for 3 legendary minion, whenever a friendly battle pet dies, draw a card. Obviously more interesting than a lot of these uh, battle pets out there, it itself not a battle pet though, so uh, it is a enabler for a battle pet deck that is more controllable. One of the big problems with this is that your battle pets always attack at the start of your turn, so you can't play Hydrax and then get your battle pets killed to get value out of it, so your opponent will always have an opportunity to react to your Hydrax uh, before it gets you significant value. It's possible that with something like Soul to give you the ability to reactivate your battle pets, that can be different. But generally speaking, Hydrax is not going to be able to easily get you value, so uh, not as powerful as a card looks on its surface, but still potentially very good in the right deck. Speaking of cards that are good with battle pets, Zukong, this may be sort of the battle pet enabler that is the most important. If three costs three, four, so reasonable stats to begin with, you control your battle pets. This feels like the sort of centerpiece of uh, a lot of those possible battle pet decks. Kind of sad to see this, in fact. Uh, obviously, it's a, you know, a mechanic that you can uh, you want to be able to play with. It's like, oh, well, battle pets do this. It's like, well, now you have this card that lets you control your battle pets, and that's pretty interesting. But it's kind of sad to me if you have like battle pet decks that are largely defined by drawing something that takes away battle pets' battle petness from them, which is kind of what this feels like it might do. Um, that being said, I do like the fact that there is sort of centerpiece cards for these battle pet decks that can give them uh, the strength that they need to be successful if their sort of raw stats aren't enough, um, and Zukong is certainly one of them. All right, next up we have Nasher. Uh, it's a 3-3 three, three for 4 with Dying Wish, deals 3 damage to all enemies around it. It feels a lot like Frostbone Naga or Sunset Paragon, except kind of worse than either. Uh, the fact that it's Dying Wish rather than Opening Gambit makes it much less reliable. Uh, if you you know are looking for something that does more damage, you have the Paragon. If you're looking for something that deal that deals guaranteed sort of smaller amount of damage, you have the Naga. And it seems difficult for the the Nasher to really find a home uh, in constructed play when those options do exist, along with obviously all the spells and uh, uh, other other minions that are available to the specific factions. So not a card that I expect to see a lot of constructed play. Powerful battle pets to re-enable with soul. Oh. We'll have Rar. Rar is hilarious to me that his name is just Rar. It's like, Rar. Well, I crafted a Rar, and it attacked into something and gave me a, uh, I think it was a Yun, and I was like, okay, I'm already sold, because this is sweet. Um, and this is, in my mind, the the most fun of the, uh, the, the battle pet enablers, and I, by the way, love playing it with uh, Flash Reincarnation, uh, because you just get multiple things immediately when you you play it for less mana and then you get to attack with it earlier so hooray i love it <laughs> um but uh this is you know probably my favorite of the battle pet cards because it can create cool exciting moments what are you gonna get uh, i'm sure that a lot of people don't like it because of the randomness involved but it, it's a sort of centerpiece card of a lot of these battle pet decks one one thing that kind of feels sad to me a little bit is that there's so many neutral legendary centerpiece cards to these battle pet decks. It feels like uh, a lot of them will just kind of feel the same and that the faction-based battle pet cards don't really add a ton to what's going on with the core of each of them. Um, but overall, uh, I definitely like that there's uh, you know a lot of tools that people can experiment with the combinations of you know how many Zukongs, how many Rars, how many Hydraxes. Do I play all of them? Do I play some of them? It's interesting to me. Um, but the fact that they're all legendary does also make it kind of difficult to actually get them all to put in your deck, 
but uh, I'm looking forward to the time that I can actually build that deck because I don't have them all yet. But anyway, they are the, certainly the sweetest of the uh, the battle pet enablers, and this is the sweetest of the battle pets, so I want to play them all together. And last, and well, I think actually least, is Silverpeak, which is funny to me because this is a 6-9 uh, a uh, for 6 uh, that appears to just be flying around, you know, flapping these wings or whatever, and then there's the Storm Aratha, which is just kind of a beetle, which is a 6-5, the flying. I don't get it, Flavor Judge! <laughs> but, eh, some stats, some mana cost. Cool. We did it. <laughs> but anyway, that's it for my overview of all the cards from the Shimzar expansion. Uh, I'm going to be getting into a, a deeper look at some of the decks that I have been working on and uh, playing with those on my stream. So, uh, I hope to see you there, so thank you all very much for watching, and uh, let me know what you think of my thoughts, uh, and what cards you think from the Shimmer Expansion are going to stand out, so thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.